Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arseblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Uh, we're recording this not long after the triumphant, glorious victory in the Europa League over Karabag in Azerbaijan. Their manager suggested that we might be afraid too scared to bring Henrik Mkhitaryan because of the political situation between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, the uh, the former Borussia Dortmund man decided to sit this one out, probably quite sensibly, but their coach, whose name is something like Gerben Gerbanov or Gobov Gobobov, Goblov Globatov, whatever his name is, we weren't afraid. There was nothing fragiler about the way that we uh, made that decision. We didn't need Henrik Mkhitaryan. Why would we need Henrik Mkhitaryan when we've got Emil Smith-Rowe? Yeah, that's right. You go on and try and make your political points and, and big up yourself in front of your Azerbaijani mates, sticking it to the Armenian who didn't even make the journey. And you forget all about the blonde-haired English wonder kid who scored the second goal between your goalkeeper's legs. How about that, Globrov Blovanov? You never even considered the possibility that this young man would would deal your side a devastating blow at a time in the game, in fairness, where they were playing pretty well. You might even say that the goal came against the run of play. And just when Grabislav Grabanov Grobolov Grobolar thought that his team was getting back into it, there was the young man playing in the position that probably Henrik Mkhitaryan would have played in to get on the end of a lovely pass from Alex Iwobi and to drill the ball between the legs of the goalkeeper to make it 2-0. And after that, the momentum changed. The game kind of swung in our favour. And you can be quite sure that back in London, Henrik Mkhitaryan was sitting there in front of his gigantic TV. It's probably a 4K. Footballers have probably got 8K or 16K. They just don't tell us mortal folks about these things. You know, it's like the Nando's black card shit. They get all the good stuff for free, even though they can afford it. Not that I'm saying Nando's is good, by the way. I just want to make that very clear. It's not good. It's bad. I know many of you out there probably like Nando's, but I'm sorry. I had it once and it was like... Anyway, the point I'm making is that Henrik Mkhitaryan was sitting there in front of his gigantic TV... With the words of blah, 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 ringing around in his ears and he'll have thought, ha, see you for the return game in London, pal, when I might even possibly play. Or not, it depends. Maybe Emil Smith-Rowe will keep his place, but it doesn't really matter. Justice is, well, this isn't justice. It was a completely different player scoring. But I think Mkhitaryan would have enjoyed it. That's what I'm trying to get across here. Henrik Mkhitaryan would have enjoyed that goal. And I think we should all enjoy that goal. A young man who's made the breakthrough from the Hale End Academy, Sean in preseason, has been given some chances. And wow, I thought he was really, really impressive uh, against Carabag last night. I know it's tonight when I'm recording. Just, you know, pretend as if it's live or whatever. But I thought he was really, really good. Some beautiful turns, some nice passing, some good dribbling. I think we could have a player on our hands here, folks. I don't want to hype him up too early, but I like what I see from Emil Smith-Rowe, and I was uh, delighted to see him score, and obviously delighted for the other two goal scorers as well. Socrates, he gets his first Arsenal goal, bundling home with his, I think probably his right nipple. Uh, Monreal headed the ball across, and he just deflected it in with a mighty pectoral muscle and a, a little flick of his nip. And then uh, late on, Matteo Guendouzi scoring his first Arsenal goal set up by Alexandre Lacazette. Quick feet on the edge of the box and he, uh, he put it past the keeper who maybe, maybe should have done better. But you can't argue with a 3-0 result away from home in the uh, Europa League. Apparently, this was the furthest we have ever, ever travelled for a European game. Ever. We've gone far, and we've gone farther, and this is farthest. The farthest we have ever gone uh, for a European game to Azerbaijan, to Baku, and we've come away with three points. 
and uh, I think there's some things to talk about. So what I'm going to do is bring in our guest now, just uh, to tell you in a few minutes after we talk to this particular guest, I'm going to talk to somebody else because recently we had the news that Ivan Gazidis is leaving the club. He's going to leave at the end of October. Just a little space there for you to silently weep to yourself. It's going to be emotional, I know. But head of football relations, Raul Sanyehi, will become head of football. He will have greater responsibility. So I wanted to uh, talk to somebody about him who, who can tell us a bit about what he did at Barcelona, for example. So I'm going to talk to uh, Dan Hilton, who's the host of the Barcelona podcast and also uh, part of the uh, Barca blog team. We're going to talk Raul Sanyehi a little bit later in the show. But right now, to talk Europa League, 3-0 win over Carabag and all the rest, it is the man from East Lower. Hello to you. Hello. Oh, hello. I just want to ask you, just very briefly before we get into mm-hmm. this um, this discussion about Arsenal, which of the Carabag players stood out most for you last night? I think it was probably one of the ones <laughs> in the dark coloured shirt. No, I have one of those. The names. Was it, one, was it the guy whose name ended in V or Z or which, which guy? I, I think there was one uh, who really <laughs> stuck out on the he was the one that was going through the middle, and sometimes um, he ended in yeah. Maybe he was called Pavlov. Pavlov, yeah. I believe <laughs> I believe he's got a number of dogs. <laughs> yeah, he does. He does. But they weren't on the pitch. No, sadly, sadly, um, we could do with some dogs on the pitch, perhaps for some entertainment. But okay, look, we won three 0 away from home in a Europa League away clash. On the surface, on the face of it, you know, there's not a lot you can argue with when it comes to the result. No, 3-0 and, you know, continuing our nice little run. Uh, it was pretty, well, it was pretty comfortable with a few sort of hairy moments. But, um, you know, I think you have to you have to look at these things through the prism of the Europa League, you know, which is, a, as we know, because it's our second season and it is a, is a, a, a strange competition at this stage. So, um, but I think we did all we needed to do. I mean, what, that, that's pretty much how it, uh, how it panned out. Do you not harbor any concerns that one of the, you know, one of the themes, and I, you know, I, I will talk about the good things, I promise. Um, but one of the common themes of this season has been the amount of chances that we have offered up to the opposition, and I think offered up is is probably a good way to put it because we found ourselves exposed and we've allowed the opposition to get in behind us. Is this still? a group of players trying to figure out what it is that Unai Emery wants? Is it Unai Emery trying to figure out how to get these players to defend? You know, I think Bernd Leno made two, at least two, maybe three really good saves in this particular game at times when a goal conceded would have changed the complexion of what was going on. Yeah, I don't think it was a problem of individuals. It wasn't you know, your, your main man, mm. Skodran who you love so very much. Uh, um, I don't think we had what we saw were any sort of calamitous uh, individual errors. Uh, I just, I think actually, if you look through the back back line, there were some good performances in there. I think, as you say, Lino did really well, very well. And I thought Holding was good. Mm. I thought I thought um, Socrates was really good. Um, I thought uh, so, Klasen actually was a bit rusty, but it got a bit better as the game went on. But overall, I, I don't think there was anything, you know, there were, there were no standout um, stand out weak, weak players there mm. but I just think I, I just think like like you, you like you said it's more about what's he trying to do with this defence where they, where's he trying to take them and I don't think they're there yet and I think at some point um, at some point maybe this time next season or in the summer you'll start I think he'll start discarding a few and getting a few in and that's when you'll start seeing what he really wants to do because at the moment it, it feels like he's still not quite sure you know what's going on there so, yeah, I don't think it was a people thing. It's more of a structure and, and what he wants, and I don't think anybody quite knows that yet. Yeah. I mean, he started with a three at the back, which was interesting because he has been wedded to this this uh, four two three one formation throughout the season, and then we go away from home against a team like Carabag, who, with all due respect, you would you would back us to impose our game on. You know, this was only his 10th game in charge, you and I, Emery. You know, was this about him showing his tactical flexibility was it uh, you know a, a system designed to negate the qualities of of Karabag based on the scouting that he's that he's had you know I, I found just the, the change in formation a little bit strange 
I, I'm not sure I did really, because I think if you're going to try something, and he needs to try lots of different things to see see what clicks, if anything. But I think if you're going to try it, you try it on a game like this when you know we won the first group stage game. We should get through the group, um, and you know I think it's you know he's going to left a few players behind and or on the bench to give him a rest. I think it's almost the perfect time to try something a bit different. I mean, I think had we... He obviously did change it up after a while, but um, I, I thought it was a relatively risk-free time. Um, as you say, with the greatest respect to Karabag, it was a fairly risk-free time to t- try something a bit different. Mm. Half-time change again. How do you... Mm. W- what's your feeling on those? I'm Is starting it- to really yearn the 68-minute change. <laughs> <That's> a- <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I quite admire it in a way. I, I think, you know, it, it, he's going to try it for a half, doesn't work, try something else. And um, uh, I just think, you know, the, the big picture for me is that we're, we're it was his 10th game, like you said, and 10 games is nothing, right? So um, he's just fiddling around, around the edges, trying to make stuff, trying to get a bit of a better picture of how it all is. And if that means half time changes, so be it. I, you know, if I was going to stick my neck out, I'd say probably you'll find there are fewer half time changes towards the end of the season once he knows what's going on but you know we are always quick to judge and 10 games in is really nothing he's just juggling stuff around until he works out what's best mm. okay i mean that's fair enough it's a very sanguine approach to uh to analysis a of like, a football game but that's you know i'm okay with it <laughs> it's a bit like when people after three games of the season look at the league table and start you know saying oh my god we're in trouble think no 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 just give it a time um it, it's it's it is too early, even now, to make any sort of definitive judgments other than we're still not defending that well, but we're winning. So, yeah. um, you know, I think these things will settle down once once he's had a bit more under his belt and then we'll start to see whether it's, you know, we'll start to see whether it's it's a personnel thing, a structural thing, or whether Emery's just not quite getting it right, all those kind of things. I just don't think we know yet. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I just, you know, har- harbour some concerns that if we give up those kind of chances to to better teams, we might just end up on the, the wrong end of a, a very difficult result. But look, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it because it is eight wins out of eight. I think I think they said on BT tonight that it's maybe th- over three years or more than three years. I can't remember. Maybe I just made that up. But it, I think they said something like that. It's th- over three years since we won eight games in a row in all competitions. So that really is the positive thing. You know, if you want to flip it around... We're not playing that well. We are offering up a lot of chances, but we're winning games. And actually, um, I suppose if we talk about uh, playing well, if a striker is scoring lots of goals, we'll say, well, this is great. We're getting the best out of this striker and the striker is, is doing his job to great effect. What we've seen, I think, this season is that our goalkeepers are playing very well. So you can look at that two ways. One is like, don't make your goalkeepers that busy. Yeah. But the other the other side of that is if your goalkeeper is that busy, it's probably better that they're capable of making the saves that we've seen Petr Cech make. And in the last couple of games, Bernd Leno has made important saves. He made important saves in the game against Watford. And I think he made very important saves in the game against Carabag uh, last night. Yeah, I think he made three very, you know, good, good saves. Not 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 well, sort of world class, but all, all good saves. And uh, you know, it's fascinating in a way because all those rumours that were coming out of London Colney about how he wasn't all that, you know, he wasn't all that. Uh, Emery, I'm talking about here, you know, wasn't mm. uh, liking what he saw, and so he was being, uh, Leno was being held back. But from what I've seen in the last two or three games, that doesn't really ring true with me. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he held him back to kind of inspire a bit of competition and to get him you know fired up a bit because uh i think all everyone from time to time needs a bit of you know a kick up the arse and um maybe that's it was as simple as that he thought you know he'll be coming in at some point let's make him hungry yeah. he certainly looked very good in the last couple of games so and unless he you know um uh unless this is unusual which i very much doubt because he's played a hell of a lot of games uh, for you know his previous club then i think uh We've got a good little, good good keeper on our hands. Yeah, well, I hope so. And the actual the the uh, the competitive environment that he has created by picking Petr Cech and going with the experience and leaving a twenty two and a half million pound signing on the bench, which is not what most you know uh, managers do. Certainly, it's not something that Arsenal do is spend that much money on a player and then leave him on the bench. You know, maybe that's part of his thinking. It's fostered this this competitive environment to to keep Petr Cech on his toes, which has worked, and when Bernd Leno has come in, 
uh, he knows he's got to play well to keep his place, to take his chance, and he's done that. I think so, yeah. I mean, I think you could really argue that's exactly why you held him back. But, um, hey, we're not privy to what goes on behind the scenes. But c- certainly nothing I've seen about uh, Leno since he's started playing is, is has been anything other than pretty positive. We hope he can keep that up, obviously, uh, going forward, because we do have more tricky fixtures coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, you know, Fulham on, on Sunday, we might touch on that a little bit later on. But one of the other big positives of the night was Emile Smith-Rowe. And... If it were Arsene Wenger who had given Emile Smith-Rowe his first starts and uh, got a goal out of him on his third game for the club, you know, it would be another, oh, Arsene Wenger does it again. And I suppose we have to give credit to the Wenger structure for bringing through somebody like Smith-Rowe. But he really does look like an exciting talent, doesn't he? He does. He looks strong and um, he looks... um like he, you know, he likes to run at people, which is a, you know, part partly a sort of uh, an indication of his youth. But also, he does look good, and he made a couple of um, a couple. Of, he tried a couple of nice things, and and as you know, spun around a few times, and then of course the goal was very very well taken. Um, so yeah, I don't think he he can be um, well. I mean, if he gets what fifteen games, you know, where, you know, as a sub or something this season, I'd say anyone would say that's a pretty decent return for someone that age and. Uh, I think what you don't want to do is do, in a way, what happened with maybe Wilshire and Fabregas, although they were ready at that age. But you know, they, it, it, you know, I think it takes a lot out of you at that age. So maybe holding him back a bit, edging him in like this is the best way of doing it. Mm. And it is good, I suppose, to see young players coming through the academy and being given a chance and and proving that you know. The transfer market is something that captures the imagination of everybody because who doesn't like a new signing? You know, when you buy a new player, everybody is like completely invested in this guy. They want him to be good. They love a transfer. You know, all of us included, I think here, you know, there's something exciting about it. But when it happens a bit more organically, when I, when it's a young guy who's been at the club since the age of eight or nine or 10 or whatever it is, there's something a bit different about it. I think so, and the fact he's British as well really, I, I think it adds a little something to it because everyone likes to see a, a sort of a local lad come through. Mm. Um, so I, I think everyone, I think people are often um, prepared to overlook sometimes um, other things that maybe they wouldn't overlook in other players that age, just because they're local. But I think he, you know, he's 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 done all he can, and um, you know, if you if you look back at some of the players we had, like people like Kieran Gibbs and and Oxford Chamberlain and all those players, and well, Cox when he was younger yeah, mm. we, we did sort of cut them quite a lot of slack in their early days because they were because you know, they were British and, and um, um, or maybe we do it for everyone it just feels like I think people will, will these you know, will the local lads on a little bit more because you know, because you know uh, it's an English club and you know to bring English players through is a nice thing yeah well speaking of local lads somebody uh, else who has had a really good season so far and I thought he was very good against Carabag as well is Alex Uwobi who doesn't seem to necessarily get that quite Get get it in the same way. I know that he declared for for Nigeria, obviously because of his family. But he represented England at under seventeen, many youth levels until about under seventeen. Then they completely ignored him, so he went for Nigeria. But it's overlooked, perhaps, that he's the same as Smith Rowe. He's the same as Wilshire. You know, he came yeah. through from a really really early age at Arsenal. He joined at eight or nine years of age. He's come through the grade, come through all the academies. He's gone through a really difficult period in his career as well. You know, when he burst on the scene, he was played in the, the camp now against Barcelona. He was really exciting. He added something new and a bit different to a team that needed it at that point that was maybe a little bit stale with somebody like Theo Walcott in it. And then found it a bit of a struggle, you know, and he's not the only one, in fairness, who has found developing as a young player a bit of a struggle, particularly in the final years of Arsene Wenger's reign. But he seems to be thriving under Unai Emery. And the perhaps he sp- what's interesting to me, actually, is he spoke about freedom and he's playing with freedom and he's he's uh, he's performing with freedom. And that's sort of an a. Uh, 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 a thing that you would expect Arsene Wenger to grant a player, whereas Unai Emery, you might think he's got bigger structures or more rigid structures in which a player must operate, but perhaps being within certain confines allows him to play in the way that he's playing. Well, that's right. I suppose, you know, you kind of ask yourself, what does what does playing with freedom, you know, how, how do you define that? Maybe maybe the, the freedom he feels is, is because he knows what he's doing. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's... Um, 
it's he, he does he's definitely made a big improvement this season and I suppose if you're going to look at sometimes it's I think you guys have spoken about it before tons on, on the previous um, podcast this season but sometimes it's hard to um, kind of know where Emery's making you know what, what the really big differences are but with a player like him you can say he definitely he's definitely better than he was last season and um, something's changed there and it's great it is great to see he's been he's been again very direct he's creating um, goals uh, still sometimes holds on to the ball a bit too long but mm. you know I, I still think overall he's been a very very positive player and he's definitely knocking on the starting 11 now I think this, uh, which is which is great it's great for him and yeah you're right he's, a, he's another local lad so um, it's quite exciting when you get two of them in the same team you know passing to one another and scoring yeah and we've also got Hector Bellerin I know he came from Barcelona but he came at 15 16 years of age he's 23 now so he's 7 8 years nearly with Arsenal and that's uh you know, I think having those players who've come through the ranks and who understand what the club is about really is a, an important thing. I was curious as to your take on the strength of the squad that Emery brought to to Azerbaijan. It's a long trip. It's five and a half hours each way. And he's brought Mesut Ozil and he put Mesut Ozil on. He brought Alexandra Lacazette and he put Lacazette on. People are looking at the the game against Fulham on Sunday at noon and saying, well, maybe we should rest players a bit more. But it just strikes me that the fact that he put Ozil on, he put Lacazette on, he, he maybe he's a man who, who looks at continuity as a thing that's more beneficial to a player than rest. Yeah, it could be that. It could, uh, it could be that it's not, you know, they're going to get them at most half a game. Um, and uh, it's it's better to have them kind of ticking over like a finely tuned engine than dropping in and out of the side. But um, maybe also he just realises this is you know this is the situation we are in, and this is the competition where we pro- it could easily be our best shot at getting back into the Champions League. So um, on that basis, and he's won it three times. So on that basis, to kickstart your own career as Arsenal manager, um, you know by by going far into a compet- competition such as this it would mean a lot and it would buy him a lot of time if he could go, go into the um, I'm not saying he's doing it for selfish reasons I don't believe that for a second but I, you know, I just think you can't, you can't afford like Wenger or other managers have done in the past I don't think we can afford for a second to take this competition lightly No I would agree with you I do wonder if as the season progresses we might see our priorities change a little bit because I do, you know you look at the table now and we're in fifth, we're on 15 points, same as Tottenham, two points behind Chelsea, we're only four points behind the leaders. We are, I think, in a better position than I thought we would be after the opening two games of the season. And I think, uh, obviously, we, we uh, or he deserves quite a bit of credit when it comes to that. I just wonder, is his approach to the early part of the Europa League group stage, is it about qualifying early and making sure that we're not having to bring key players two games far away because we've got this game against Vorskla which apparently this is the game where we've got a long flight and then it's like a three hour or four hour uh, journey by road to get to the stadium and then I think you've got to you know take some donkeys or whatever it is it's it's a difficult one but those games I think that that Vorskla game comes right after the game against Liverpool at the start of November. And the following two games, we've got North London Derby and also a trip to Old Trafford. So I wonder how much strategy there is in terms of the way he's thinking about the Europa League. It's like, okay, we've got a good chance to win our first two games because they're against the two lower or the two easiest, if you like, teams in the group you've got a trip to uh, Portugal to play Sporting Lisbon so if you can qualify after four games then you're in a really good position to leave some players behind and bring a weakened team if you like and make sure that you can then rest players for for what are going to be difficult Premier League fixtures yeah it makes a hell of a lot of sense and and well you know with Christmas kind of schedule will be sort of looming you know, in, in the not too distant future at that point as well. So I think you're right. You're playing Fulham on the weekend and Fulham have not started that well. And uh, whether he'd have done the same thing in terms of who he'd have brought with, uh, if we're playing a more formidable team on the weekend, it's a, it's a really good question. But um, yeah, why, why not get it done and dusted? But also, um, you know, for, to come on for 20, 30 minutes, I know it's a five hour flight there and back, but to come on for 20, 30 minutes, um, you know, it's, it's it's not too, you know, it shouldn't be too taxing in that respect. No, I mean, is there a, a possibility that we 
have become, in some ways, you know, we had a terrible injury record for a long time. And we were afraid that if you went to a game like this and you brought key players like Ozil, like Lacazette, that they ran the risk of getting injured. And things have improved a great deal in that regard. And also, if we were playing Champions League football, we would be playing all of our first team, more than likely, in a whatever group game it was in the Champions League against probably better opposition than, than Carabag. So, however we view the, the Europa League or our perception of the Europa League, the physical demands or the footballing demands on the players are not any different than they would be if we were in the Champions League. Or are they? Because maybe the, the level's a bit lower. So, um, mm-hmm. my, my, mind you, you know, some of the teams we played in the Champions League group stages were, um, again, you know, sure. there, there wasn't, it didn't always feel like there was a huge lot of competition there either. Mm. Uh, it, wasn't, it was when, when the competition really started was when we... Uh, would uh, crumble like <laughs> cr- crumble straight away, but um, I don't know. I, it's it's it, it strikes me as being pretty wise to get you know to keep keep the momentum going for what is a very good run, and um, and also it's better to start well than to have to kind of pull your eggs in the basket at the end of the group stage when you're suddenly realising that it's looking a bit hairy. So I mean I'm, I'm all for it, and you know we've got a pretty big squad. We've got a squad that needs a lot of guys need to play. So. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, and also he still needs to see all these players more, you know, see who they play, you know, try them out in different positions, different formations, um, and in different variances. And so I'm, I'm sure he looks at it a bit like that as well, thinking I've got so much le- to learn here about these guys before I can really pass judgment. And uh, this is a good opportunity to do it. So, uh, yeah, I, I have no problem with taking a very strong squad there. Uh, in general, how are you feeling about life under Unai Emery in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it? Is it meeting expectations or did you have any expectations? Or um, I, I don't think I really had many expectations. I certainly didn't expect to be anywhere near the top four this year. So on that basis alone, we're hovering up quite nicely in the league. Um, I did expect us to and probably naively, but I did expect the way we play to change a bit more fundamentally than it has. But again, 10 games in, I mean, how much, I mean, how kind of radically can you change it? Mm. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that you can. Um, so uh, well, I'm, I'm enjoying it because it's different and I'm enjoying it because uh, we, we're seeing some new players and we're seeing some, you know, a nice little run of form. But yeah, like like most people, I still... I wonder where, whether it's going to be a sort of evolution or revolution type thing, and it feels at the moment very much like the like the former. Hmm. I mean, does it? I mean, it, it sort of feels to me like he is the kind of manager who will. What's the word I'm looking for here? I want to be careful about the way I say this. Like, I'm not sure that Unai Emery is the manager who will get us back to winning the Premier League but I do think he's probably the kind of manager who could get us back into the top four at which point we might find a manager or might find it easier to attract a manager to be competitive when it comes to winning the Premier League if indeed that is the ambition of the club if that makes sense I know I know what you're saying is that the you know, question still yeah, we know that you know, players like managers like Guardiola and Klopp clearly at the top of their game at the moment, and they're they're the guys to look up to. And Emery feels like a notch down from that. But he won the you know, he won the league on with PSG. He's won a lot of trophies. I think his record's pretty mm. pretty good. Um, so I I would agree that if you were going to put money on it, you'd say he, he the chances of winning the Premier League are pretty slim. But I, I, again, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, just yet, I think um, uh, you know he was. He did get. He did get signed up by pretty much one of the wealthiest clubs. I know it's in France where the competition is slightly less, but you know they, they must have seen something in him too. So I like. I like to think that uh, we might stand more of a chance than you think. But um, it's early days, isn't it? Yeah, I mean that is the caveat that we have to look at. Everything I think it's through. funny. Sorry to butt in. I think it's. I think so much of it is not so much down to him or to someone to, to the man leading the club. A lot of it's to do with finances, and you know, when you when you're able to spend thirty million quid on every single outfield player, and then have two in each position, then it's almost it feels like an almost impossible job, whoever mm. you are, to to 
you know, to to get up to that point. I, I really feel that, that that kind of thing is so hard to compete against. I, w- I would agree. So let me ask you this before we go. Uh, Stan Kroenke, KSE are going to be the 100% owners of this football club very soon. Um, how do you view that when it comes to the monetary side of things? Do you expect them to put their hands in their pockets to fund the requirements that we would need to be Premier League champions again? Not in the way that uh, Man City do, because I don't think that you know they run it in a they run it in a more business like way. Mm. And um, and and you know what, it might be detrimental to us, but I I would almost rather it, it was run a bit that way than um, money coming from. So yeah, you know, some, from someone like sovereign wealth funds, and I don't know. I feel it feels like a, um, it's obviously very difficult to win the Premier League, whoever you are. But to to be able to throw that kind of money at it doesn't. You know, it feels. Um, I wouldn't say cheating. It's not. It's not cheating. It just it feels like giving you a ma- massive advantage, though. And, and in a way, I think it's quite noble to try and actually uh, run the club on 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 the money that you earn or generate yourselves. I think we can do more there and I think there's more deals to be done and I think what I, if I expect anything I don't think they'll put money in their pocket. They've never done it to date. No. As in, yeah, I, but but I do maybe think that they'll come at the commercial side of it a bit differently perhaps now that Gazidis is on the way out and there'll be some changes in the boardroom level. You know, what what that means in the long term is precedent with with the owners doesn't really tell you that uh, anything will change drastically but um perhaps in the commercial side of it the business side of it it might yeah well that's the thing isn't it it's a bit like manchester united who are massive uh from a commercial point of view but who don't have people in charge of the club who know that much about football you know to make the right footballing decisions you know that's well no it's it's an interesting one because for them you know I th- the point I was making about having the money to buy every player you want kind of applies to Man U as well, but it hasn't quite worked in the same way. So obviously there's a lot of skill and long-term planning that's gone into uh, what, what's happening at Man City. But um, I still think uh, it's hard for a club like us, run as we are, mm-hmm. to um, to 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 kind of really take them on head to head. Sometimes mm. were you surprised by Gazidis' decision to to up sticks? given the seismic changes that he was obviously uh, a big part of, w- was it a surprise to you that having made those changes and being the master of, or considered at least the master of of uh, the changes that took place at Arsenal, he hasn't stuck around to see how they worked out? Yeah, yes and no. I think yes, because it felt like just as it, like you say, just as he got it, how he wanted it, it would have been nice to see how, what happened next. Um, but no, because well, for two reasons. Firstly, he's been nine years in the job, nine years at, as, a, as a sort of CEO type person. It's a hell of a long time, I think. And may, maybe the whole, the whole, in his mind, the whole, um, the whole way he was planning it was to be able to do this and then say, look, I've left it in good hands. I'm off. Mm. And there's also, which I think, yeah, you know, there's also the issue is how now that the club is hundred percent Stan Kroenke's, was there always going to be a change at that point? Was, you know, is, is someone else coming in to do that job? Uh, and cause he just knew it all along. And then, you know, uh, and so that's why it all came to an end like that. But I think nine years is a long time, long time in any job. And so, in, in some respects, I wasn't that surprised. Okay. All right. Well, look, we will see where this season takes us. As you say, it's still early days, so we're uh, we're learning along the way. I think that's part of the fun, isn't it? That we, we don't really know exactly what to expect, whereas we could always predict what it was that Arsene Wenger was going to do. We're not quite sure what it is that Unai Emery is going to do, and I think that is, uh, that's part of what makes it interesting. But look, we'll catch up with you a bit later on in the season. Uh, Jim, the man from East Lower, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much indeed to the man from East Lower. You can find him on Twitter at East Lower. That is at East Lower and occasionally blogging still at eastlower.co.uk. That's eastlower.co.uk. It's only when the mood takes him, though. He's not in the mood very much these days. What can I say? We all get a bit older. Right. 
Raul Sanyehi is our new head of football. He is going to take over the running of the football side of Arsenal when Ivan Gazidis leaves at the end of this month. So I wanted to get a bit of background on Raul and to uh, find out what kind of a guy he is, what kind of work he did at Barcelona, where he was director of football for over 10 years. I'm joined now by Dan Hilton of the Barcelona podcast. Hi, Dan. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm all right. Let's talk a little bit about Raul Sanyehi and where he came from. I was curious to see as to whether or not he was, uh, how steeped in Barcelona he was. And I found his LinkedIn, which hasn't been updated for quite a while. There's a very useful uh, Raul uh, picture of him there. But he went to a uh, a private school in Barcelona in Saria, which is one of the most exclusive areas. It's a Jesuit school uh, in Barcelona. So he has that in his blood yeah, he was actually born in Terrega, which is in Lleida, which is in northwest of Barcelona mm. in Catalonia. So he is Catalonian through and through uh, or Catalan through and through. But it was really his move to, to the U.S. that kind of started the professional career that he that he had when he joined Nike. So it's not necessarily a footballing background that he comes from. But here in the States, if you're talking Nike in the 1990s, which is right about the time when Obviously, 1996 is when he hooked up with Nike. You're talking Michael Jordan. You're talking Air Jordans, especially here in the U.S. Mm. But Nike was also already working on that global brand. And that's when he goes back to Spain and becomes a managing director. Um, so, again, we're really talking the marketing side and not not as an intellectual going to a private school, but a, a guy who is certainly not – in the traditional footballing sense, a guy coming up through that pipeline. Yeah, he did. Uh, he did go to the uh, Guildford College, where he was a member of the soccer team. So he's clearly a, a, somebody who enjoys football and playing football. And if you're Catalan and you're a, a fan of football, there's generally only one team you support, and that's Barcelona. So he went from Nike to Barcelona. He was sort of like a director of relations uh, for a little while, and then he became the director of football there, which is a fairly important position at a club like Barcelona. Yeah, I think the most amazing part of that that whole journey, or to say that his his cadre of, of promotions, was the fact that when he became a sporting director in 2008. I would want to always remind people that he managed to survive the presidencies of bo- of not both, but all three uh, of Juan Laporta, Sandra Rosell, and Jose Maria Bartomeu, who's currently the president, um, two of which being Laporta and Rosell that are complete opposite personalities. Mm. So he has been very fluid in his ability to kind of work with different presidents and work, obviously, under Barcelona. And yes, Arsenal, as you know, brings tons and tons of pressure, but there is this trope that the Spanish media is the most vindictive and and just absurd in its uh, amount of media coverage of, as I said, of, of absurdity, of, of stories that are just completely off the rails. And we know that the British tabloids are one thing, but yeah. the Spanish media seems to add just a little bit more vindictive nature in the way they talk about both the boards and the 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 directors but obviously the players as well yeah i mean i think the thing about the the spanish media that people have to realize is that there are four daily sports newspapers which are dominated by football you know you've got marca and ass which are the madrid-based ones and then the sport and el mundo deportivo which are catalan based and and friendly towards barcelona so there's a huge amount of media coverage uh, that goes on so if he's been able to uh, traverse that particular uh, area pretty well then that's uh, that's a good sign one of the the key deals that he was involved with uh, during his time as director of football and we might in a minute just talk about some of the cross over between Arsenal and Barcelona because there have been some deals done down the years between the two clubs where I think uh, perhaps uh, we might have come out on top uh, on this side of the water with uh, with the money and the players that you got but we'll, we'll discuss that in a minute but Neymar is uh, a deal that was done and he was very very uh, heavily involved in that I'm not sure whether we can say all of it was particularly above board or there were some questions certainly about how it went down but, but if his job was to make sure that deal happened he did a good job yeah it winds up being a net positive it has been reported that he was one of the main figures in going to brazil meeting with santos and most importantly when it comes to neymar meeting with his father who does do all of the backroom dealings and while yes things aren't necessarily positive in the press and there is money that is still we'll say unaccounted for in the case 
it winds up it winds up being because of that treble in 2015 for Barcelona, obviously a net positive in, in both PR and just the way that the deal was conducted, knowing that Real Madrid was most certainly going to be doing the same thing and they were pulling for Neymar as well. But I think while he does get so much credit for Neymar, we cannot forget that in terms of the current Barcelona and the way that they're built, he also had a major hand in bringing in Luis Suarez, even Rakitic and Marc-Andre Ter Stegen as well. And unfortunately, unlike the, the the latter three, Neymar leaving for PSG, that really wound up being a big striking point in his departure because the club felt that he was partially to blame because of the hand that he had, because of the relationship that he had with Neymar's team and particularly his father, that after 15 years of the club, he still didn't seem to have not only the pull to be able to keep Neymar from leaving, but he just didn't have the ability to convince Neymar's team to stay. And while obviously I would not put so much of the blame, it seemed that the player himself had already made up his mind and it just seemed like the parties, as as you remember that summer last summer, mm. there was that two, three week period where things really did transpire very, very quickly. And it, it it's I find it funny that in the same way that Ronaldo's team and Ronaldo kind of parted ways with Real Madrid this summer, that it with the when the superstar wants to go those big moves seem to happen very, very quickly. Yeah. And due to Spain and obviously their their buyout clauses, which is you pay the buyout clause and you're good to go, it worked very similarly with the Neymar deal. It just happened very quickly, and that was it. And I don't really know how much more he could have done. Well, I mean, uh, you tell me anybody who's got the ability to convince somebody that taking 200 million euros... Um, whatever else he's being paid by uh, Paris Saint-Germain uh, is is a bad idea. You know, when he's got, he's got his father on one side, he's got this, uh, you know, he's been sold the idea of being the star at this big club. Well, suppose a club that wants to be a big club, uh, certainly in terms of reputation or how they do business, if not necessarily in terms of, you know, what they've done in the football world down the years. Uh, you know, that's an impossible job for anybody to turn around and convince Neymar, OK, stay at the club where Messi is always going to be the number one guy because he's simply a better player than you always will be a better player than you he's going to be the the focus of the fans love more than you even if they do love you you know it's an that's an impossible job I, i'm curious as to what people expected from him and why he would have been in some ways a fall guy uh, for what was just an astonishing amount of money being thrown at, at neymar well the most interesting thing i think of the whole story is that the final nail in the coffin was actually pretty much completely unrelated to Neymar if reports are are accurate. And there seems to be this big rumor that has kind of been confirmed on his end that the handling and Barcelona's inability to sign Jean-Michel Serri, who you can now watch at Fulham, mm. but at the time he was a midfielder at, at Nice in France in, in their first division in Ligue 1. And the, just the breakdown that Barcelona seemed to want to sign the player and the player wanted to come to Barcelona. And when things seemed to be on the finish line, you're not really sure who in the back rooms were the one who struck down the deal and said that no, but this is a player that clearly he had worked on trying to get at the club. And I, again, I think there's a breakdown. And we're even seeing now with another player from Ligue 1 with Barcelona in in Malcolm, who came from Bordeaux, that it was a player that clearly the board wanted for X, Y, Z reasons. And whether that might be again with Barcelona because he's a Brazilian and they have again a lot of sponsorship deals and maybe there's rumors that they're even a commitment of a, of a number of Brazilians on the roster and things like that and while that's very skeptical and I find it hard to believe there are clearly disconnects and because Ernesto Valverde the current manager of Barcelona didn't necessarily want Malcolm there is this disconnect between even different sporting directors as we, as we can see and the, the people who will then be paying the salary at the end of the day and I, I think when Arsenal kind of swept in for him, it was very easy to pry him away because it seemed like he was already on the on the outs already. And so it wasn't this big coup that Arsenal came in and was able to snag a sporting director at Barcelona. I, I think it was just very opt opportunistic that sure. it wound up being a perfect time for that transition for him. Yeah, and for Arsenal. I mean, just sort of on the, the transfer dealings at Barcelona, in terms of the authority or the, you know, was he the guy with the ultimate authority, the final say on whether a deal would happen? Or was he somebody who 
who was more a fixer who could put the pieces in place, but approval had to come from uh, above him or from the board or from uh, the president, however that worked. So, yeah, it's, it seems that uh, the president, Josep Maria Bartomeu, has that ability to give the final thumbs up or thumbs down to deals. But in July of 2017, due to restructuring of Barcelona's management system, it was Pep Segura and in Barcelona circles, that's a big name of consternation. But when Pep Segura became the, the director of football in July of 2017, it did kind of restructure the power struggle there. And now here in this year of July 1st of 2018, Eric Albidal and uh, Ramon Planas became technical director and assistant to the technical secretary, respectively, or sorry, technical director or technical secretary and assistant to the sec- technical secretary. But mm. nevertheless, with those two in tow as well, that restructuring kind of forced out the position that he at the moment, or that being Senyei, was occupying. Mm. And it's it's kind of said with, with Pep Segura that he has a bigger hand in, in La Masia, but it seems that there is this power struggle, even particularly to the kind of players and the profile that everybody at the club is kind of looking for. And I, I think that for... That his relationship and friendship with Ivan um, Gazaitis, it wound up being a striking point as well for him to take that opportunity to make that jump and not say get away from Pep Segura, but it, it appears that, and it's, it's kind of been a blanket statement that it's not just him, but Segura's relationship with a lot of the people that have left the club behind the scenes in the last six months to a year apparently has not been very good. So basically any executive that has left in the last, you know, since the last summer, it's kind of assumed that they didn't have the best relationship with Pep Segura. Right. So he's kind of uh, footballing napalm in a way. He's burning all all before him and after him, I guess. Um, over the years, there have been some uh, deals between Arsenal and Barcelona, which have... Uh, which have earned us quite a lot of money. Thierry Henry moved there. Cesc Fabregas moved there. Uh, we've done we've done it the other way. Alexis Sanchez, a player who was you know a bit like Sanjay, uh on the way out uh, at at Barcelona because of uh, the arrival of Luis Suarez, but Arsenal did a deal there. Uh, we've had Alex Kleb, Alexander Song. Uh, I, you probably don't want to hear the, that particular name, uh, but you know. And yeah, he has been in some ways connected to Arsenal. You would assume that as the director of football at Barcelona over the years, he's had good contacts with the people at Arsenal. And that is uh, probably has gone some way to to landing him the job. Uh, you know, his relationship with Ivan Gazidis down the years uh, has been documented. So it, it's quite an interesting concurrence of 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 interest there that when his time was up at Barcelona, he's moved to a club with which he's had plenty of dealings. Yes, yeah, certainly. And, and it's said that when Alex Sanchez went to Arsenal, and obviously that was not fine for Barcelona, but because of the, the front three, the trident of Suarez, Messi, and Neymar, there really was no place for for Ale Sanchez at the club. And when you look at a lot of the relationships that Barcelona have with some of the other boards, like obviously a PSG or another one of the giants of world football, they're not going to do any dealings or any business with the likes of Real Madrid, not going to do any dealing to the likes of PSG if they can help it. And even a Bayern Munich, when they were trying to sweep for Barcelona players, Barcelona fights them a little more. And then you land on a team like Arsenal that they have such a good working relationship with. And it's true that Sanyehi was at really at the center of that. And even for me, from an outsider, I'm really curious seeing after he had joined in February of 2018, working on those transfers and it, with with a obviously I'm in the states so I follow Christian Pulisic who's at Borussia Dortmund mm. where Sven Mislintat came from and for me looking at Arsenal structure I think it's a really good idea to have a guy like uh, Sanyehi who does profile as the guy in the boardroom he's a guy that does get things over the finish line and it's it's silly I don't want to say he's like some theatrical closer or the guy that comes in with the sunglasses indoors and takes them off to sign and finish those <laughs> deals. But um, Mislintat, the, you look at the profile of the players that he has gotten for Borussia Dortmund, and they really do fit the kind of style and the kind of club that Arsenal currently in is. And I, I really like that that relationship with Sanyehi being able to, to 
take those players that he scouted and put them over the finish line. And that's just a kind of one-two punch that even for me as a Barcelona fan, I wish that there was a clear setup like that, that Barcelona had, oh, they have this guy. And it really was a little bit like that with Robert Fernandez, who would be the guy to scout and would be the guy to, to take things where they needed to go until Pep Segura could help push things over the line as director of football. But it seems to me that Arsenal have just a much more fluid system in the, in the way that's going to work. And again, it's it's a little jealous on this side. Oh, well, look, don't worry. We've had a, a number of years of our transfer dealings being a little more protracted and perhaps a little less decisive than they were this summer. And if there's some evidence of what Sanyehi will bring to Arsenal, it's an efficiency in bringing players in because we had all our incoming business done by July, really, and it's often been a case, particularly when Arsene Wenger was the manager, where deals were really protracted and went all the way to the wire and, you know, towards the, the transfer deadline where Wenger thought and often did get some some uh, some good business and got some bargains down the years, but there's a lot to be said for preparing your team uh, properly and making sure that your transfer business gets done. And now that he has this, this extra bit of authority, which is, in essence, the same job that he had at Barcelona, it is going to be very interesting to see how he dovetails with Mislinta and, you know, with that authority, how he gets transfer business done in the future. Yeah, I think one of the things that really strikes out to me in today's world of modern football when it comes to transfers, it's not even, particularly at Barcelona with La Mazia, it's not even the high profile Henri's or Alex Song or whoever it may be at the first team level that makes me nervous about transfers between not necessarily even those two clubs, but when you even look at Man City, who keep prying away and picking off all of these different Barcelona youngsters, because obviously in England, and Arsenal is run differently, and the money that Arsenal has at their disposal is very different than Man City. I mean, obviously Barcelona can offer on these contracts, when these players turn 16, they can offer probably more money than Arsenal, we're not entirely sure, but as we've seen with youngsters in the past, and now Cesc Fabregas, that was many years ago when he made the jump, mm. obviously. So it wasn't necessarily this global money that we're working with. But even a guy like uh, Joel Lopez, it's a name that I want to put on people's radar. He recently went from La Mazia to Arsenal's academy. Yeah. Um, and it's those kind of players with now Mislintat in, in tow and Sanliehi having that background in, in Catalonia that Man City are coming for the... The youth players, Man City are the one who are on the attack trying to grab Barcelona's brightest. But there is that second tier of players at, at Barcelona in their academy that they are producing so many top level talents. And obviously not all of them are going to be in the Barcelona first team. And it's obviously historically difficult to get in there in the last five, six, seven, eight years. Again, Sergio Roberto is probably the last guy to break through. And yet... For Arsenal, there is a class that could also be pried away with the money and Premier League money that Arsenal has. So my biggest worry isn't even Barcelona players getting whisked away to North London. My worry is when Sanyehi comes potentially calling for guys who are 15, 16 years old or just about to be 16. And he says, hey, we've got some Premier League minutes for you over here. Mm -hmm. And we've got a, a pretty good Premier League contract and a salary to boot for you over here if you don't think you're going to make it at Barcelona. So I think he could have a role in in terms of that as well. Okay, well, look, uh, personally, obviously, I hope we do steal all of your best players, particularly the young (laughs) ones, but uh, (laughs) it's unlikely to happen quite as uh, in in that much depth. But look, it's uh, been a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you for for giving me your time. Just uh, tell people where they can listen to your podcast. If they're looking for a Barcelona podcast, where would they get it? Well, it's the simplest thing, as you just said. It's called the Barcelona Podcast. So you basically type in Barcelona Podcast and anywhere, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. Um, we're also on the website on barcelablog.com. You go there and we have a post that's directly related to so you can watch it or not watch it, but you can listen to it right on your desktop as well. And so it's basically anywhere where you listen to a podcast. And again, our website also is barcelablog.com. So we've got some pretty cool stuff there. If you're interested in the youth players or even the younger stuff. We do our Friday weekly uh, La Masia profile where we talk about a player, but we also have, again, their match reviews, uh, different top fives, so your sure. five top five stories of the day. And we do a lot of stuff over there, obviously, related to and dedicated to Barcelona. So as I know, in the United States, you have a lot of people who are very fluid and they support multiple clubs. And again, if you're someone like me who absolutely love Terry Henry, I've got a soft place in my heart for basically any club that 
that he suited up for. <laughs> and uh, what a fantastic player. And it was a pleasure coming on to the show. Uh, and th- thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. I like the I like the fact that you've got a specific post so we can see which young players we're going to steal from you. This is great. I'm going to go check that <laughs> yeah, out. <you're> chatting. <laughs> Dan, thanks a million. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed to Dan. Some insight and background into Raul Senyehi there. And he is going to be the man who is driving the football side of Arsenal for the weeks, months and maybe years to come when Ivan Gazidis goes. The questions that occur to you, of course, is how much authority will he have? How much freedom will he have? What are the restrictions that he's going to have to work with? What are the stated ambitions of KSE and the Cronkies? Are they going to say one thing to him and not deliver the things that he needs to make that happen? He's obviously going to have a remit. Get us into the top four. Make us competitive. Make us competitive in Europe. Make us competitive in the Premier League. It's all well and good to say those things, and it's actually quite easy to say those things. But unless you give people the resources and the backing and the support to make them happen... It's going to be very difficult for for him and for everybody on the football side of of Arsenal to to get back to where we would all like us to get back to, which is, you know, on top, looking down, going, yep, we're the champions. So uh, it's going to be interesting over the coming months and weeks and years to see how it all develops. He is, by all accounts, a very smart, intelligent guy, and hopefully he can convince Cronkies that this is a club worth investing time and money into because the rewards of that would be fantastic for them. Because if we're successful, we're going to make more money. The value of their asset, the value of their investment increases. Whether they want to sell it or whether they want to keep it, we will generate more revenue if we are more successful. So uh, I hope that happens. We have got Fulham on Sunday at uh, midday. Not a great preview, to be honest. We're going to see some changes, obviously, from the team that played against Carabag on Thursday night. Uh, hopefully, the travel and the distance between the two fixtures doesn't have too negative an impact. We've won eight in a row. It would be very good to make that nine in a row. We'll find out on Sunday. We'll keep fingers crossed for that. James and I will be here on Monday or maybe Sunday evening. I don't know yet with uh, an Arscast Extra. We'll look back on that particular game. Just to remind you that we do have some excellent stuff on our Patreon site. If you like video games and if you like football, we have a great interview for you with Danny O'Dwyer, who is uh, the guy behind No Clip. They make documentaries about video games, but we chat about video games and we chat about football. We chat about our Arsenal. If that floats your boat, check it out. Patreon.com forward slash Arsblog. It is five euros a month plus VAT if you're in the EU. If you're not in the EU, you do not have to pay any VAT. Uh, But that's all it costs. You get access to all the content that we have on our Patreon site. There's loads of stuff, a great Champions League special, articles, other history podcasts. It's all there for you for just five euros a month. Check it out. Patreon.com forward slash Arsblog. Going to leave it there because I can feel a bit of a tickle in my throat. I think my voice is going, so I better save it for the weekend and podcast to come. Thanks as ever for listening. Really appreciate it. We'll catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Stuart Gale, and I'm Tony Robson. Join us for a brand new series of Cunt Pundits. Every time there's an Arsenal game, we'll give you interminable shite, hapless bollocks, unceasing negativity, wearisome nonsense, 
ill-informed garbage, sustained gobbledygook, never-ending twaddle, incessant drivel, continual hogwash, endless balderdash, and constant claptrap. If you want to watch Arsenal and have your IQ lowered by up to 30 points in less than 90 minutes, check out the brand new series of Cunt Pundits. Pundits. It's...